in your Bibles to the first letter of John, chapter 5, if you will. We're starting to get to the close of this letter that we've been dealing with uh, now since July, uh, the 1st of July. We're in the last chapter. John is starting to wrap things up. He has been dealing with three specific topics. He's been dealing with uh, obedience to the Lord. He's been dealing with right belief or correct belief and he's been dealing with love and the nature of love and he does that three different times uh, throughout the book so there's three cycles where he goes over these three different things we're in the third cycle he's already dealt with love in the third cycle even though it bleeds over into this cycle as well this section as well and now we're going to look at the passage in first john chapter 5 verses 1 through 12 that deals with uh, right belief and obedience. Actually, flip that order. Obedience and then right belief. And I'm just going to be uh, right up front with you here. We're going to read 1 through 12 in chapter 5. And we may or may not deal with all of that today. We may sh uh, leave some of that for next week, depending on how long-winded I think I'm starting to get. So 1 John chapter 5, starting in verse 1 where the apostle writes these words, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whomever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he is born concerning his son. Whoever believes in the son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God is born concerning his son. And this is the testimony that God gave us, eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we love you for your incredible goodness. We love you for the fact that you have revealed yourself to us and not left us in the darkness. That you have sent your Son to live and to die for us. We love you, Lord God, that you've given us your word so that we can know you. We love you, Lord God, because you've given us the opportunity to come together as the body of Christ and to worship you and celebrate you and to feed off of your word together. Lord, I pray that this would be a time where we, in fact, do that, that we feed off of your word. Lord, and as the one whom you've set aside to declare your word, I, I plead with you to give me the words to say. I ask, Lord, that you keep me from doing harm to your word in any way or any manner. And Lord, we give you all praise and glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. The first two verses of chapter 5 set the parameters for the rest of this chapter, or the rest of this section in particular. He, he lays out a couple of facts for us in, in verse 1 of chapter 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Fact number one, if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, you have been born of God. You cannot understand Jesus as the God-man as the Messiah, as the Savior of the world, as the one who was the Son of God, but came and added humanity to himself. You cannot understand that by natural means. This has to be spiritually imparted to you. The Holy Spirit of God has to take this, this truth and impart it to you. This is why there are wise people from the world standards and intelligent people from the world standards who know the Bible inside and out, but will not bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ because they have not been changed spiritually. There has not been a new birth in their life. 
They have not given themselves over to this truth. It's one thing to understand a truth, to know a truth. It's another thing to apply that truth to yourself. And those who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, even though they may know who he is, have not applied that to themselves. Satan is one of these characters. And all those who follow in that line are just like Satan. Satan has perfect theology. Satan knows doctrine better than any of us. He knows scripture better than any of us. He knows the nature of Jesus Christ better than any of us. But he doesn't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He hasn't given himself over to the Lord, in other words. He is in rebellion against God. Even though he has all this knowledge about God, he is in rebellion against God. So, what, what the, the writer is saying here, what John is saying is everyone who believes, everyone who trusts, everyone who has given themselves over to the Lord Jesus Christ, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, and remember, Jesus Christ is not a name. Jesus is a name. Christ is a title. Christ is Messiah is exactly what it means. So anyone who believes that Jesus is the Messiah, is the God-man, is the Savior, they only believe that because they have ultimately been born of God. There's a new birth that has come into their life through the Holy Spirit applying this truth to their heart and them receiving willfully the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's truth number one. You do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't give yourself over to the Lord Jesus Christ apart from the new birth. There is no such thing as a Christian who has not been born again. It doesn't exist. So he is, he's laying that foundation right up front. Truth number two. And everyone who loves the Father loves whomever has been born of him. So truth number one, if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, you've been born of God. It's because of the new birth. It's all part of the new birth. Point number two, or truth number two, everyone who loves the Father, God, loves whomever, who, whomever has been born of him. In other words, if you are someone who has experienced the new birth, then you love everyone else who has experienced the new birth. So, even though he's not uh, dealing specifically with the concept of love in this cycle, he's going to deal with obedience, and we're getting ready to get into that, it bleeds over into it. And all three of these topics, obedience, right belief, and love, bleed over into one another. In other words, they're mixed together, even though the emphasis is on, on, on one specifically in different parts of the letter. So, we have these two truths. That if you claim Jesus as your Messiah, as your Savior, you've been born again. And that if you love God, and that would be someone who claims Jesus as their Messiah, then you love the people of God. Now, evidence that you actually do love the people of God is given starting in verse 2. By this, we know that we love the children of God. By what? When we love God and obey his commandments, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Now that is an incredibly interesting verse of scripture. If you think about that for just a second here. By this we know that we love the children of God. In other words, this is the way that we know that we love the body of Christ. This is the way that we know that we love the church that we love people who have been saved. How, what is that way? When we love God, okay, I can understand that, right? That makes perfect sense. Because if we love God and we've been born of God, then it makes sense that we would love the, the children of God. So therefore, loving God is a demonstration that we also love the children of God. The two should go together. That makes perfect sense. We understand that. We can get our minds around that. But he doesn't stop there. He says, when we love God and obey his commandments, and then the stress goes from love to obedience to the commandments of the Lord. In other words, it goes from loving God to obeying God. When we, by this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and obey his commandments, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. 
he actually defines love of God with obedience to God. Now, what does he mean here when he says, when we obey his commandments, when we keep his commandments? What's he talking about when he talks about commandments? Well, don't just think of this as the Ten Commandments. Now, that's part of it, obviously, because that is the instruction of the Lord. But, but at the root of what's being said here in the word commandment is the instruction of God. The instruction of God. Uh, the, the Ten Commandments, if you, if you will, in the Old Testament, are the instructions of the Lord. They are the words of the Lord. And the law that they are the heart of doesn't stop with just those ten. I mean, it, it's expounded upon much further throughout the book of Exodus and in the Leviticus uh, in particular. So when he says we love or we keep the commandments of God, he's not just simply talking about the Ten Commandments. He's talking about all of the instruction of the Lord. The instruction of the Lord that comes through the prophets. The instruction of the Lord that comes through the apostles. The instruction of the Lord that comes directly from himself through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The instruction of the Lord that is codified in the Word of God. So, Let's get our, get our mind around this now. He's saying, if you love the children of God, that is a demonstration that you love the Father, but how do we know we actually love the children of God? We know we love the children of God when we love God, when we love the Father, but when we keep His commandments, why? Why would obeying God be necessary to demonstrate that we actually love the people of God. Let me think about that for a second. We have this nasty habit of thinking about our faith as our faith. And what I mean by that is, we have this nasty habit of seeing our Christianity as something that is about us. It's about us and our relationship with the Lord solely, and it's, it's not something that's corporate. And this is how people get into the mindset that they can be, uh, you know, kind of closet Christians or they get into the mindset that they can be uh, Christians who are on their own or separated from the body of Christ, which is just simply not bib biblical in any way. Uh, the entire New Testament is given ultimately to the body of Christ. And I think it means something that the letters, uh, specifically of Paul, start out with, you know, to the saints at the church of Ephesus or at Colossae, you know, or on and on. In other words, it's, it's not addressed to just specific individuals. It's addressed to a corporate bodies. So the, everything that's, that's in the letters and the epistles is about us being a part of the body of Christ. It is assumed in the writing of the New Testament that those who will receive it will be a part of the body of Christ. There's no such place in the New Testament for someone who claims to be a Christian, but who has no uh, time or, or no uh, desire to be a part of the body of Christ in any way. But we think of our Christianity in that way sometimes. But, but what he is saying here in this is, is that if we truly love the Father, then we're going to love the, the body of Christ. And if we truly love the body of Christ, then we're going to love the Father. And we're going to obey His teachings. Why is that necessary? Because if we don't obey the teachings of the Lord, we bring dishonor to the body of Christ. If we are not people who are obedient to the teachings of God, to the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ, to what's given in His Word, how He's revealed Himself to us, Every time we are disobedient to the Lord, we, in a universal way, bring dishonor to the body of Christ. And when we bring dishonor to the body of Christ, we bring dishonor to Christ himself. Sometimes people don't see our sin and our disobedience. Sometimes these sins are private, but God knows it. And when you commit a sin that's supposedly private and God knows it, you are, in fact, thumbing your nose 
at the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ who lived for you and died for you to pay the penalty for the sin that you are in the process of committing. And you are in the process of committing more than just that sin because you're also doing it in private. You're trying to hide it. Therefore, you're being uh, devious about it. You're trying to lie about the fact that you're sinning in a sense. And you are bringing dishonor to the body of Christ. It brings harm to the body of Christ whether you realize it or not. If all of us are in the process of secret sin, we are not seeking the Lord in the way that we ought to be seeking the Lord. We are not being obedient to the Lord in the way that we ought to be obedient to the Lord. We're not walking in the way that we're supposed to walk with the Lord. Therefore, even when we come together, there is a brokenness between our relationship and the Lord because we are hanging on to our sin. Therefore, we're bringing dishonor to the body of Christ and we aren't genuinely loving one another as we're supposed to love. We're not demonstrating love of God because we're dishonoring him and not obeying him. And we're not demonstrating love for the body of Christ. Anytime, anytime we don't obey the teachings of the Lord, we bring dishonor to the body of Christ. We bring shame. Now, some of these uh, sins are more public. This is why. <clears throat> this is why there are stipulations in the scripture for who can lead and who can't lead and in the church. You know, if you've got a man who is a pastor in the body of Christ, and next thing you know, you find out he's been hanging out uh, with, with prostitutes and not necessarily to share the gospel with them, he is disqualified from being a pastor in the body of Christ. Period. End of story. He can be forgiven for that. Absolutely he can be forgiven of, of that. The, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ can wipe that sin away. But if he is in the role of a pastor and he diminishes the role of a pastor, he diminishes what it means to be in that role leading the body of Christ by being disobedient to the Lord in such a way that brings that kind of dishonor and shame to the body of Christ and to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, he has disqualified himself from being able to, to stand in that role anymore. Now, some churches don't seem to mind that but that's truth scripturally and there is a broken relationship at that point with the Lord Jesus Christ until it gets made right <clears throat> me as the pastor if I go about after preaching the word of God to Thornhill Baptist Church and then I decide that my next action because it doesn't have anything to do with you guys my personal life is my personal life I'm going to go, uh, you know, hang out with a prostitute or I'm going to go shoot up some heroin or I'm going to go do whatever, go uh, rob the local convenience store. I am demonstrating that I don't genuinely love you because I am willing to bring shame upon you. And those who truly love the Father love the body of Christ and those who truly love the body of Christ demonstrate it through their obedience to the commandments of the Father. But it's not just simply about a pastor, it's about the entire body of Christ, right? Anytime we step outside the will of the Lord, anytime we step outside the, the, the teachings and the instruction of the Lord, we are saying that the body of Christ doesn't matter to me, and in fact, God doesn't matter to me. I make my own decisions because it's my life and I'll live it the way I want to live it. And we bring shame to the body of Christ. We bring shame to ourselves and we dishonor the God that we claim to follow. That's why John's writing the things he's writing. By this, we know that we love the children of God. When we love God, and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. You, you want to know how you demonstrate how you love God? You obey God. The passage that, uh, <clears throat> that Devin read earlier this morning in John 14, and I didn't mark it, but I'm going to read back through just a little bit of it here. <clears throat> With emphasis. What Jesus says, these are the words of Jesus. If you love me, you will keep my what? What's he say? Commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. 
And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, talking about the Holy Spirit, to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you, and you will be, and will be in you. In other words, um, if you are one who is truly a lover of mine, you truly love Jesus, then the Holy Spirit will be given to you, and he will be given to you as a helper, as a guide to lead you through life so that you can live a life that honors the Lord. He says he will not leave, uh, leave them as orphans, that he'll come to them, and it will, will be in a little while. The world won't see him more, more anymore, but, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. <clears throat> and then he says down in verse 21, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Verse 23, Jesus answered, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. What's Jesus say? You want to prove that you love me? Obey me. It's really that cut and dried. It's really that simple. You want to demonstrate that you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. You want to demonstrate that you're spiritual. You want to demonstrate that you are the real deal, that you are born again. The one way to demonstrate that is to be obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. You want to demonstrate that you genuinely care about the church. You genuinely care about the body of Christ. You do it through love of God, and you do it through obedience to God. Obedience to God. See, we tend to like the love of God, but we disconnect the obedience to God thing. And we want to compartmentalize our life and be obedient in these areas, but not in these areas. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. John is driving that point home. He says in the middle of verse 3, back in 1 John, And his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. His commandments are not burdensome. His teachings are not burdensome. His instructions are not burdensome. The things that the Lord wants for us are not things that are harmful to us, difficult for us ultimately if we are in Christ. They should be things that we love as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We should love righteousness. We should love holiness. We should love justice, mercy, loving kindness, patience. All of these things we should love. We should love the teachings of the Lord. And we should love to fall in line with the teachings of the Lord. God is not going to lead us to a place that brings us harm ultimately. God knows what's best for you. He knows what's best for me. And he's not giving us the instructions that he gives us just to put us in chains. He's taken the chains off of us in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The chains that are real in our life are the chains of the bondage of slavery, of, of the, the, the chains of the bondage of sin, which is slavery. Let me get that right. It is slavery. You are a slave to your sin. You're a slave to your fallen nature until salvation comes to your house. The Lord Jesus Christ, by living that perfect life for you, dying that death for you and being raised from the dead for you and then sending the Holy Spirit to dwell with you is taking the chains off of you so that you can, for the first time in your life, live in a way that is good and live in a way that ultimately brings glory to the one who created you. And that can only mean good things for you in the end. I am not saying here that once you're saved, everything's peaches and cream. Because you're going to go through difficulties, you're going to go through hardships. What I'm saying is, when you live for the Lord, when you're saved, from that point forward, you have your eyes open, you have your ears open, you have your heart 
uh, circumcised, if you will, and you can, for the first time in your life, genuinely be obedient to the one who is what good is. And don't you want to be good? Isn't it a good thing to be good? Isn't it a good thing to live a good life? And the only way to live a good life is to live in the one who is what good is, and that is God himself. And we have the ability to do that only through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. His commandments are not burdensome. His teachings are not burdensome. So many times we think of the law of God and the teachings of God, and we think uh, of, of the things that God just doesn't want us to do because he's some horrible, you know, uh, 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 taskmaster who likes to see us squirm, but that is not the case. He does it for our own good. Why are the Ten Commandments given? If you want to just centralize it back to the Ten Commandments, why are the Ten Commandments given? They're given to demonstrate, first of all, the holiness of God, second of all, the sinfulness of man, but also to demonstrate to humanity how it is that we are to live. And so many people look at the, the, the Ten Commandments, especially the last five, and they think as if God is trying to put them in some sort of a bondage to himself. In other words, they don't like the idea that, uh, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery. Because, you know, the idea of our culture is that we are uh, free, that marriage doesn't matter, that, uh, you know, we, we are in control of our own bodies, therefore we can do whatever we want to with them, and we should be able to indulge in the pleasures of this world. And there are so many people who, who believe that way, and they think the idea that you're supposed to be married, and you're supposed to stay committed to your spouse uh, faithfully for the remainder of your life, they think that that's just, just God putting chains on you. But why is it important? Why is it a good thing to be married and be committed to your spouse for the remainder of your life? Well, there are a multitude of reasons. First of all, it protects you from, from the destruction of your emotional life. You know, people who are, are, who are unfaithful to their spouses are living in a world full of lies. And that's destructive to your emotional well-being. It's destructive to, to the way you live in general. Because once you start going down the road of living in a world of lies, you don't know who you've told the truth to and who you lied to. And you have to just keep following it up, lie after lie after lie, to keep covering your tracks. And it's destructive. It ruins families. It ruins uh, careers. It ruins lives. And sometimes people get killed over it. And sometimes people contract diseases that they shouldn't, uh, wouldn't contract if they were faithful. Think about this. Think about this for a second. If every man and every woman got married and remained faithful for their entire life, then what would happen to all the, the STDs that are tearing up our culture? Well, you wouldn't have near as many of them. Right? You wouldn't have kids who are born into families who get ripped apart because of the unfaithfulness of one of their parents. You're ripped apart from brothers and sisters and grandparents and all these other things. There's so many things. God is simply saying, don't commit adultery. Be faithful to the one whom I have given to you, and life will be much better for you. God doesn't want to put you in chains. God wants to free you. His commandments are not burdensome. His commandments are not... Uh, 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 from a taskmaster, his, his master, his commandments are because he loves you. And on and on it goes all the way throughout the, the, the instructions of the Lord. 
Verse 4, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Uh, if you have been born of God, if you've been born again, you will overcome the world. You will ultimately turn away from those things of the world and, and love the Lord and be obedient to him. And it's through uh, the victory that is your faith that this comes into your life. God working in your life through the gospel and the application of the Holy Spirit works in you in such a way that you have faith in him, you trust him, you give yourself over to him, and you have victory over the things of the world. And you begin to love him, and you begin to be obedient to him. And therefore you, you are oh, someone who loves the body of Christ. You love the children of God. Remember what the what the, the, the two statements were at the very beginning in verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whomever has been born of Him. So the connection is, love the Father, you love the body of Christ, love the body of Christ, you love the Father. Well, the one who's been born again overcomes the world uh, through that faith that they have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they love the body of Christ and they love the teachings of the Lord and they obey the teachings of the Lord. Yes, they slip up from time to time, but when they do, the Holy Spirit gets a hold of them and drives them to their knees in repentance and knowing that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and, and cleanse us of all unrighteousness when we go to him. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. It also takes out any room for us to think in any way that we can somehow earn the favor of the Lord and defeat the world, defeat the, the, the desires of the world, the, the lust of the flesh, if you will, in and of ourselves. It can only be done in Christ. It can only be done through the new birth. It can only be done through trusting Him. And I read verses 1 through 12. I'm not going to deal with all verses 1 through 12. Because if I do, we're going to be here for a long, long time at this point. Verse 5 says this. Whoever it is that overcomes the world, I'm sorry. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? It's a rhetorical question. No one overcomes the world. No one overcomes their temptations. No one overcomes their disobedience to the Lord or their lack of love for the Lord in and of themselves. Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God, only the one who is born again, overcomes the world. From that point forward, he actually goes on describing uh, who this Jesus is. And uh, we're here, let's go ahead and deal with it. Verse 6, we'll get through it and uh, we'll be done with it. I know this is not the way that you uh, get good grades in preaching class. Uh, don't really care about that, though. So, uh, you know all about that, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. This is not orthodox. Verse 6. Because from verse 5, what he's saying is, he who overcomes the world, I'm not going to keep you a long time, I promise you. Uh, he's, who, he who overcomes the world, world is the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And then he starts to, to, to describe or give evidence that Jesus is the Son of God. He says in verse 6, This is he who, who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree. So what he's saying in verses 6, 7, and 8 is that Jesus is the one who came and he came in such a way that there is testimony by God himself, at least three different witnesses by God himself that demonstrate that he is the Christ, that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. He came by water, he came by spirit, and he came by blood. What's it mean, first of all, that he came by spirit? He came by spirit in the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that comes upon him at his baptism, uh, which works in him throughout his ministry in this world. And it is the Holy Spirit of God that is an eyewitness to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. What does it mean that he came by water? It means, uh, I think it's a reference to his baptism. And the 
baptism that he would uh, 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 perform from that time forward, but I think it's specifically his baptism because it was at his baptism that he goes under the water and he comes out and we see the Spirit of God descending upon him and the voice from heaven from the Holy Father saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. So that water, the, the marking out of the beginning of the ministry of the Lord Jesus and the descending of the Holy Spirit upon him and the, the, the fact that God the Father is pleased with him uh, is a, an eyewitness to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Christ. And the blood, the blood's obvious, right? It's the shed blood at the, at the, at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. The fact that he spilled his blood to pay the penalty for our sin is an eyewitness testimony by God that he is the, the one who came to save the world. Verse 9, if we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. Makes sense. For this is the testimony of God that he who is born, uh, that he has born concerning his son. Whoever believes in the son of God, now he gives the, the, the testimony the testimony is the, the blood, the water, and the spirit. Now he starts to codify this. Whoever believes, verse 10, in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. In other words, these three eyewitness testimonies are in them as well. The blood covers their sin. The Holy Spirit of God indwells them. And the water of baptism that they go through is a demonstration that they are following the Lord in his baptism as well. Uh, whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God is born concerning his son. If you don't believe Jesus is the Christ, then you are saying that the three eyewitness testimonies by God himself through the water, the spirit, and the blood aren't good enough for you. Therefore, you're saying, I don't believe God. And you're saying God is a liar. It's not a real good place to be, is it? And then he wraps it all up in verse 11 and verse 12. <clears throat> and this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. I'm sorry. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. <clears throat> this is God's ultimate testimony. He gave us eternal life. And it's in his son. And whoever has the son has life. And whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. I don't have to expound upon that, I don't think. If you have the son of God, you have life. If you don't have the son of God, you don't have life. So, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Whoever loves the father loves the children of God. And how we know that we love the children of God is that we love God and we obey his commandments. And by the way, which God is it that we love and obey? It's the one who came to us by testimony of the water and the spirit and the blood. And it's in him that eternal life exists. And if you have him, you have life. And if you don't have him, you don't have eternal life. And he wraps it all up. This has been a real convoluted sermon. I understand that. It's been kind of all over the place. That's okay. First and foremost, wrapping up. Have you been born again of the Holy Spirit? Have you been born again? Have you received the new birth? Do you know Jesus is your Savior? And it's not just something you know in your head. You've actually given yourself over to Him. You have sub submitted yourself to Him committed yourself to him? Do you re receive him as your Savior and your Lord? Question number one. Question number two. If you claim to have received him as your Lord and Savior, can you demonstrate that? Does your life demonstrate that? Do you love God? And if you say you love God... Do you actually obey his, command, his commandments proving that you love God? Not talking about perfectly, but that's the desire of your heart and you are actively trying to be obedient to the word of the Lord. And when the word of the Lord comes in conflict with your life and your beliefs, you realize that your life and your beliefs 
are what needs to be corrected, not the word of the Lord. Question number three. Do you love the body of Christ? Do you love the children of God? If you claim to love the children of God, once again, do you love God? Do you obey God? Those are the three questions for us today. And everyone in this building has got to answer it. And you can delay it if you want to, but by delaying it, you're answering it. Because when you delay to respond to the word of the Lord, what you are saying is, I don't want to respond to the word of the Lord. Because your actions give evidence of what's really in your heart, not your words or your thoughts. So as Jerry comes to lead us in our hymn of invitation, those three questions should be bouncing around in all of our noggins. And we should honestly seek to answer those questions. And we should honestly seek to answer them honestly. And we should respond to the Lord with an honest response to him in answering those three questions. So, if there are any in this room who, who do not know the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ, who you don't have eternal life because you don't have the Son, the invitation is open. If there are any in this room who claim to know the Lord Jesus Christ, but the truth is you don't demonstrate love for your Father, you don't demonstrate your lo love for God, or the Lord Jesus Christ, because you don't obey Him, then you need to repent of that. And you need to turn to Him. And if there are any in here who claim to be uh, someone who loves the body of Christ, but once again, you don't demonstrate that through obedience to the word of the Lord, through love of the Lord, you need to repent of that. Whatever the Lord would have you do, however he would have you respond, the invitation is open as we sing only trust him. Hymn number 317. Jerry's going to lead us in that. And I will be up here to talk to anyone who needs to talk. If you need me to pray with you, I will pray with you. If you just need to come forward and pray by yourself, that's fine as well. Um, if you need to pray where you are, that's fine. Whatever the Lord would have you do, respond to him though. And do it quickly. Do it earnestly. Don't hesitate. Because you may not have another Sunday. You may not have another Monday. You may not have another Sunday evening. Respond to the Lord while you have the opportunity to respond. Stand with me and let's go to the Lord in prayer. And then the invitation will be open. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the fact that you have sent your son to live for us and die for us. Thank you for the salvation that's offered in Christ. And Lord, I pray that you would work in the hearts of everyone who is here today. And that whatever burden you put upon them, that they would respond in a loving way to you. And we will give you all honor and glory. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. How awesome.